Well, praise the Lord. Revelation chapter 10. This mystery is getting bigger and bigger. Bigger and bigger. And uh, God wants us to know it. But I'm going to say this. There is one aspect of this mystery that I, I don't believe that we'll know it until a certain time comes. And I'll explain that uh, as we go along. There, there's just something that, according to the Bible, has not been revealed yet. It's in the scriptures. Don't, I'm not denying that. But you know how it goes. You can read the Bible... But unless the Holy Ghost gives you understanding of the Bible, you really won't know it. You'll just read it on this surface level and the, you won't really... It's sort of like the parable that Jesus taught. He would teach his parable about some guy throwing seeds all over the place. Well, the disciples came to him and said, We don't get it. What does it mean? And then he would explain to them, and This is how I'm going to teach you all parables. Listen closely. So he explained the seed is the word. And then he said, you know, these are they by the wayside. And these are these among stony ground and thorny ground. And these are the and good, good ground. And so then they understood it. It was the same parable, unchanged, but now they understand it. And so there is something here. And I'll just, I'll just tell you the verse. It's in 2 Thessalonians 2. Uh, and it says, and then shall that wicked be revealed. So there is a... There is a wicked man who is all through the Bible, but his true identity is not known currently, but it will be known. And so, yes, sir. Didn't it say when they talk, they talk of parables that for them it's not, it's not going to be known, but it's for you? Exactly. And that's what I just, that's basically what I said was because Jesus was doing afterward what the Holy Ghost does with us who are saved and have the, the spirit in us, spirit of knowledge, spirit of understanding, spirit of wisdom. We have those seven spirits abiding in us. And as we read the parable, we can see the interpretation of it. Lost people who do not have that spirit, unless the spirit opens their eyes and lets them see it, and that's, I'm going to be talking about that in a message this morning. Unless the Holy Spirit opens their eyes and lets them see it, they will not understand it. It's just, and I've touched on this before. Isaac Asimov, does anybody know who that is? He's a Russian. He is a uh, science fiction writer. He's dead, long dead now. But he wrote, if those, anybody who reads science fiction knows who Isaac Asimov is. There was a magazine that came out every month. It was a sci-fi sci magazine, and it had stories in it, and it was called Asimov. But Isaac Asimov was an atheist. But he decided to write a commentary on the Bible. And I was staying at a pastor's house one time for a uh, camp meeting, and they happened to have a copy of Isaac Asimov's um, Bible commentary. And I'm going, how does an atheist comment on the Bible? And basically, Asimov, as an atheist, uh, turned, you know, he took all the miracles and turned them upside down and basically made them out either to be fables, mythology, anything but a true story, or that it had some sort of natural explanation to it. And so that's how an atheist would write a Bible commentary. And the bottom line is, he not only read the Bible, but he studied it. He studied it long enough to write this commentary and he didn't believe a word of it. And to my knowledge, he is in hell right now wishing that he'd have paid attention. Wishing that God would have turned the light on to him so that he could see what, he, what it was he was reading. But he had no understanding of it whatsoever. Uh, the same is true I hear of Alexander Scorby who read the King James Bible and made that famous narration of it, uh, to me it's the best. It's the best reading of the King James I've ever heard. And, uh, but he didn't believe it. it. It affected him in no eternal way. And to my knowledge, he died lost. So anyway, that's, uh, we'll get to that. 
Ephesians, well, let's read Revelation 10. <clears throat> let's see here. Verse 5. The angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein that there should be time no longer but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound the mystery of God should be finished as he has declared to his servants the prophets. And so we've been looking at what that mystery is last, uh, the Sunday before last. By the way, we did. It worked out great with us doing the service uh, earlier uh, on that day when we go to camp. Uh, we had plenty of time to get down there. We arrived uh, basically when everybody else uh, was told to arrive. I think they, everybody else supposed to show up around six. And that's just about the time that we got there. And, you know, you take in all the stops that you have to make for kids going to the bathroom and things like that uh, to fill up with gas and so on. And uh, we made it down there in plenty of time. Uh, we weren't rushed in any way and it just worked out well. So uh, we'll keep that in mind for next year. Um, but anyway, the Sunday before last, we were we were looking at the mystery in relation to. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. And that, that relates to the rapture or the translation, the marriage of the, the bride and the bridegroom, the lamb and his wife and so on. And now we're looking in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9, which is what I have up on the screen. And Paul said, uh, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will... So, and let me just throw this in. Have you ever struggled uh, in the area of knowing what God's will was for your life? And I think if we were to be honest, all of us probably at one time have struggled with, God, what do you want for my life? What do you want me to do? We have important decisions to make, big decisions. And we know that the repercussions of making the wrong choice will last us a long time. So we appeal to God. We cry to God and say, God, show me what you want me to do. Show me what you would have me to do. I don't want to go outside your will. So God, would you make that known to me? Um, and I've had people come to me and ask me about that. I've had preachers come to me and ask me about that. And I like to keep things simple in explaining things in the Bible. And I look at it like this. When Israel was in the wilderness, there was no mystery to them about when they should go and where they should go. Because they were led by a visible sign the entire 40 years that they were in the wilderness. In fact, from the moment they left Egypt, God's physical presence was with them in the form of the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of cloud by night, or f pillar of fire by night. So that even if, they, even if God at midnight said, we're leaving, he was a pillar of fire, and he s gave light to all the camp of the Israelites. And by that light, they broke down their camp. The Levites broke down the, the, uh, the tabernacle, packed it all up according to the law, and one by one, starting with Judah and ending with Dan, they, they followed the Lord through the wilderness, even in the middle of the night, because God led them by the pillar of fire. And I, I basically tell people that Israel, on any certain day, when they got up in the morning, they looked over toward the tabernacle. And if they saw that the pillar of cloud was there and remained there during the night, they said, okay, we're going to go about our business. We're going to gather the manna. We're going to... You know, do whatever we do with it to make bread or to make cereal with it or whatever it is to feed our, feed our uh, flocks with it or whatever. And then um, if God moves, we'll know it because we'll see him pick his presence up from the tabernacle, move over, let's say, to the next valley. And that was God's sign. Everybody pack up. We're leaving. And God would wait there patiently for them. 
And that's something that I think is important to understand in understanding God's will and knowing the mystery of His will is that God is a patient God. He understands that we don't see things that He sees. We don't see things that angels see. Uh, our sight is limited. Our knowledge of the future is extremely limited. We do not know from one second to the next what will happen. If I would have known, if I would have had five seconds of knowledge of what would happen to me, I would have never allowed that wasp to hit me on the arm right out here the other day when I was working on my house. I mean, I heard the wasp fly by my ear and the next thing I know, he's on my arm stinging me. And that makes me mad. Oh, I was mad. If I would have known five seconds ahead of time that he was coming, I would have avoided that because I hate him. Um, but we don't have that. I had no idea that wasp was there. Bam, got me. So we, don't, we can't see into the future. God knows that. So like when God called Samuel, he said, Samuel, Samuel got up, thought it was Levi or Eli. He runs to Eli. Did you call me? No. Middle of the night. Samuel, again, runs to Eli. Did you call me? No. Lays down again. Samuel, he gets up, goes to Eli. I'm hearing somebody call me. What's going on? Eli perceived what was going on. And he said, next time you hear that, um, say, uh, hear my Lord. So he lays down and God says, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel responded to the Lord. And uh, when I surrendered to the call to preach, um, I had some doubts. And preacher golf said this to me. He said, Mike, he said, and he re relayed the story of Samuel. And he said, I think the Bible's clear. I'd rather have God call me four times and me know that he's calling me than to think God called me or God said something to me and, and be wrong in it. And that made a lot of sense to me. It, it was, it was, there was wisdom in what he said. And that's true, I guess, of everybody. Is uh, the Apostle Paul said, uh, make your calling and election sure. Uh, I would ask you this morning, do you know beyond any doubt that you are truly born again? Do you know that? And you can know it. In spite of what some people tell you, in spite of what the Catholic Church would tell you, you can know whether or not you're going to heaven or not. And anytime you have doubts, I would tell you to go read the entire book of 1 John. It's only five chapters. It's not going to take you long. You can still get in another episode of Wheel of Fortune if you want to. Okay? You won't miss a thing. Um, and I can't believe Vanna White's still doing that. She's got to be, what, 90 years old, something like that? She's not in a wheelchair yet. And they don't need her, is the thing. Because, I mean, she used to turn the, the letters, right? And she just goes by. They don't need her. Anyway. Um, yeah, you can, you can know it. Make your calling and election sure. Um, God knoweth the thoughts of man, that they're vanity. And so... Prove all things, hold fast that which is good, all right? Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, this is about God and what he wants, not necessarily what you want. And keep that in mind. God does not yield himself over to your will or to your desires or your lust. He does not yield himself over to that. In other words, God does not give you a pass on the things that you do simply because you say, well, I'm a Christian, I'm a child of God, and uh, I'm going to heaven and I know it, and I can do these things, and it's okay because God's never, God's never got me for it. If God's never punished you for anything you've ever done, I'd say you're not saved. I mean, that's one of the signs that you know you're born again is God's rod on your backside. That's one of the sure signs. 
I preached that last Sunday. Um, so anyway, his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. That gathering, that, that word gather and gathering and gatherings and so on in the Bible, you ought to study that out. It's amazing. You'll find there's two gatherings that's going to take place in the end. The gathering of all of the people affiliated with the Antichrist by way of his mark on them. The mark of the beast. He's going to gather and collect everybody together as one body. It is a mockery and a mirror image of Christ appearing in the clouds, gathering together his elect from all of the places that they're in. He gathers us together and makes us truly one body with Christ being the head. And so part and, and when we see the word mystery here in verse 9 related to the gathering together in verse 10, that matches what we saw in 1 Corinthians 15 concerning the rapture because that's what the rapture is. The dead in Christ shall rise first and we which are alive remain shall be caught up together. The word together has the word gather in it, doesn't it? Together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So this is, this is still part of the mystery of the rapture, the mystery of the translation. That he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. I like that. An inheritance is given to a child whose father has passed on and he has left everything that he has to his son. And that is a perfect understanding of the nature of God and Jesus Christ. Is that God, he is the creator of all things. He created everything through Christ. And Christ now will inherit all things from his father. But we, being one in Christ will be joint heirs with Jesus. And that's what it means here in verse 11. We have obtained an inheritance. What do you have to do to get an inheritance from your father? Nothing. You're his son. He's going to leave uh, everything. He can't take it with him. Certainly can't take what he's accumulated in this life with him. So... They make arrangements. He's made arrangements. Your father may have made arrangements with you to leave things in your hands after he's long gone. Uh, and then it'll be up to you. And that was in the law. The law said that if a man owned uh, an inheritance from his father, like Naboth's vineyard, Naboth, uh, Ahab wanted to buy his vineyard. Naboth said, I can't sell it to you. It was given to me by my father and I'm supposed to pass it down to my children when I have children. So I can't, God forbid it me that I should sell you my vineyard is what he said. I can't do it. The law says I can't do it. So why are you asking me this? And so Jezebel had him killed so that the inheritance would be stolen by Ahab and it was. But our inheritance uh, is eternal life. It is heaven and earth. Because Jesus is Lord of both heaven and earth. And uh, we are the inheritors of that because we are the children of God. We are sons of God, not by way of any earthly thing that has been done to you, your church membership, or um, the fact that you read the Bible through in a year, or none of that matters. You must be born again. And that new man, that inner man on the inside of you, is what will inherit all things. So, uh, boy, now we're getting into something deep. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. All right, I got to stop here. And talk about what predestination is. Because... It's 
clearly written in scriptures. The word predestined, uh, let me look that word up. Let me see here. Do I have my Bible search program? No, I don't. Let me get out of this, and we'll look up all the places in the Bible where it mentions predestination. Somebody tell me what you think is a good explanation or a good definition of predestined. What do you think that means? Now, the big question is, does the idea, well, the word destiny is in the word predestination. And people will say, it's my destiny to do this. In other words, I was appointed to do this. I must do it. And there's no way I can get out of it. Um, if you've been made an executor of someone's estate. You have a destiny that is laid out for you. That person who asked you to be uh, the executor of your estate, of your will, that the one who executes the will, the one who actually puts everything in motion and gives out everything the way it's supposed to be given out. That's what, a, that's what a, uh, someone who executes a will, that's what they do. You have been destined to that position. And when that person dies, if you are still alive, then you are destined to, to execute faithfully that person's will. You have to do exactly what he said. You have to follow his commandments, his will. In fact, that's what we call it, the last will and testament. So you have to follow exactly those guidelines that's written in the will. You have to do exactly what's there. Or you, as the executor, could get sued. You can get in trouble legally. So it's, it's, not, it's a big responsibility to be an executor of someone's estate. Um, but if someone trusts you enough to do that, I'd see it as an honor. Uh, so the question is, those choices that God knows we make, does he, in fact, force us to make them so that his will is carried out? Free will is, is biblical. It's biblical under the, the issue of choice. In the Garden of Eden, two trees. One is life, one is death. God gave an instruction to Adam which one to eat from, which one to not eat from. But if God did not want Adam partaking of that particular tree under any circumstances whatsoever, then he would have removed that tree, put it on the moon, and said, you can't touch it. Does Adam then have a choice whether or not he can have it or not? No. It's not even a choice. There's no way Adam could go to the moon or Pluto or some far out galaxy somewhere. God could have put it in heaven. We would, we would have no way of reaching it. So that in itself is not a choice. Uh, Joshua said, choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. God told Moses, Moses tell the people in the book of Deuteronomy. I read this last night. Um, God said, I have set before you life and death. Choose life was God's instruction to them. But they had a choice, didn't they? And how often did Israel make the wrong choice? Multiple times. They chose death rather than serving God and having life. So clearly... We get, Israel was offered Jesus and Barabbas. And I think Pilate went and dug through the prison and found the worst possible criminal he could find. Someone who was a murderer, someone who was guilty of, of treason, someone who was a thief and a robber, brings up Barabbas 
I mean, he's all nasty, ugly, face scarred with, with hatred and, you know, just an evil person. And here's Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. And he asks Israel, pick one. Pick one. One represents the tree of life, Christ. One represents the tree of death, which is Barabbas. They chose Barabbas. Give us Barabbas, crucify Jesus. So clearly people get a choice. So how does predestination fit into this? Look at verse, uh, I'm going to got Romans 8, 29 here. The Bible says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So, we have a clue here. And that clue is that God's predestination, or God setting our destiny in life, to be a child of God was based upon God's foreknowledge of every choice we would make in life. Okay? Um, Chris, you play chess? Mm -mm. I don't either. I throw the pieces, turn the board over. Yeah, I, I quit playing chess a long time ago. But if I knew every chess move that my opponent was going to make ahead of time, I'd beat him. Yeah, it would be easy. If I knew all of the answers to questions on Jeopardy ahead of time, oh yeah. You remember the, um, the um, I can't remember the name of the show, but it's, these numbers would light up around the board and there would be a whammy there. You remember that? There was a guy who sat at home and he watched that show, he videotaped it. He figured out that it wasn't a random pattern where the board cycled through these numbers. He learned that there was an actual pattern to it and the producers didn't know this. They thought that it was random enough, but it wasn't. It had a pattern to it. The computer wasn't programmed right. And this guy figured out the pattern. He auditions and gets on the show, and he is breaking the bank every day. And nobody can beat him. And finally, about the third episode of him being on there, between the third and fourth episode, they're going, he knows something. He's learned something. They figured out that he saw a pattern in how those pieces were moved around and he knew exactly when the whammy was going to come up and he never hit a whammy. He always hit a dollar amount every time. And because he knew the cycle and knew how it cycled and everything like that. And they were contemplating throwing him off the, the show, but they, they couldn't do that. He, they signed a contract with him. He signed a contract with them. He was playing fair but he was cheating nonetheless because he learned something that they, it was their mistake. And so after like five episodes, they, they had, I don't know how much money he won, but he won a ton of money from there because he knew all the choices. Well, this is God. By his foreknowledge of us in everything that I have done, am doing now, and will do into eternity, God knows me. And he chooses whom he knows. Just like he chose Pharaoh to be the Pharaoh, the one who is going to be the enemy of God's people, God chose that Pharaoh. The Bible makes that very clear. And so in verse 30 of Romans 8, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. So he uh, predestinated them, he called them, he justified them and he glorified them. And justified and called and glorified are all and predestinated. They're all past tense. God has already, uh, George, God has already justified you. He's, all, he's already glorified you. You are already there in God's eyes. Already. And he knows this. Um, Ephesians 1, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ, according to his good pleasure, the good pleasure, that's what we was reading. And then in verse 11, in whom also we have attained an inheritance, being predestinated according 
uh, to the purpose of him. Let me look up one more word here. I know the bell rang, but let me look up uh, this word foreknowledge. First Peter. Here it is. We are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. So God elected me, which means he predestinated me because he knows, already knows the outcome of everything, every second, every day, every year of my life. God knows the outcome of every decision that I make. And so God doesn't elect people to be saved who he knows they're going to turn their back on him, walk away from him, and never, ever yield themselves over to the Lord. John Calvin was simply wrong in this. Calvin had it in his mind that because man uh, is depraved from the Garden of Eden, that man cannot make a decision to follow Christ. That's wrong. That's clearly wrong. And I, I don't know why there's still Calvinists around today, but they're, they're all over the place. And um, they, they simply believe that man doesn't have a choice. Man never had a choice. Man can't have a choice. And so therefore, uh, God is the one who elects us and we don't have any part in our salvation, which I don't believe. I don't believe that at all. All right. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this lesson. I pray to your God, Lord, that uh, you would give us light and understanding. Lord, these are high things, things that are too high for our understanding. I don't understand, Father, some of the, the ways that you have and how you can know everything that I will do in the future. But I accept it. I believe it. And I thank you, God, that you have given me and these people a heart to know you, to want to know you, to want to live for you, to want to live right, and to honor and please you, and to be the people that bring pleasure to you according to your good will. And so, Father, when you said that all things work together for good, you know that. You know it beyond any doubt because you see everything that happens to us. And while something that happens may not be joyful, may not be fun, it may bring us great sorrow. Yet, Father, you know the outcome. And you've already determined for us and given us the hope that in the end, it will all turn out for the good according to your will. Thank you, Father. Lord, give us light and understanding, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.